Hi everyone, welcome to episode 2 of Aquaponics Adventures. Um, today I will be going over a few different things that I have planned uh, for upcoming episodes, uh, as well as going through the nitrification cycle and uh, the bacteria that take care of that uh, in the grow beds, which really is the heart of the aquaponics system. So I've had a couple different ideas as far as uh, projects regarding the show. Um, one of them was to take the show on a bit of a field trip to Barrier where they have a water reclamation facility that's recently been built that is taking the wastewater and putting it through a series of filters and biological nutrient removal processes to both irrigate their parks and fields as well as potentially growing things in their greenhouse um, ornamentals at this point but maybe in the future food if it becomes uh, feasible and safe um, so yeah I was thinking about talking to the guys up there and seeing if I could do a short segment on their facility I, I've been volunteering there recently and thought it would be an interesting project uh, to see this done on a larger scale that's actually quite a cool facility so uh, yeah I'd love to show everybody that uh, another idea I had was to build a small aquaponics system for my wife's kindergarten classroom. Um, she's going back in January and I was thinking that it'd be kind of a cool project to put something together that she could have in her class that the kids could use to learn about, you know, all the different pros processes and go on in this type of thing. I mean, there's a lot to be learned, so I thought that was maybe an idea I could have funded through uh, donations and you know just put together cheaply from scraps around the house you know just something to do in my spare time that would be a benefit to the greater good all right now on to the main topic that I wanted to cover on today's episode and that is right beneath your eyes although you can't see it um, the grow beds are filled with all kinds of bacteria and that's the main workhorse behind the whole process here What's happening is they are doing the work breaking down all the fish waste and turning it into available nutrients that the plants can thus absorb. So the nitrifying bacteria that thrive in this environment need a high amount of oxygen available to them, um, as well as significantly warm temperatures. So the higher the temperature, the faster they're able to break down the ammonia and convert it into uh, nitrogen. So that's why I've installed a heater and that's set to come on uh, if the water temperature drops below 22 degrees Celsius. Now an issue I've been having with that uh, on a, from a technical standpoint is you can see here there's actually quite a long wire attached to the temperature probe and what happens is when this big light turns on with I imagine some interference from the transformer as well uh, it causes electrical uh, interference through the wire uh, distorting the signal so what happens is the controller down there doesn't read a valid signal from the temperature controller so what I've done is just a simple programming modification that senses if the values are regular and if it is it won't bother adjusting the state of the water heater. So basically what that means is if the lights on and it's interfering with the probe the temperature uh, programming will ignore it. If the lights off then based on what temperature the water is it'll adjust the water heater to be on or off. So basically, that's fine because at night it'll adjust and correct itself and at this point that's that's okay. However, I do want to find a way to determine exactly where that interference is coming from. So I found a little project where you can build a, it's called an EMF microphone to kind of detect that um, spatially around your environment to see what devices are putting out what kind of interference. Um, through a set of headphones or speakers by converting it through a chip. So yeah, it's a future project. I think I'll do an episode on that one day. Uh, basically, I'm sure it'll just involve shielding this wire so that it's not getting uh, 
that interference, but I don't know, that's something for me to learn and good project for the show, so that'll be coming up in the future. So back to these bacteria. Now that they have warm water, warm oxygenated water, they're able to do their their thing. And it's a, a function of surface area as well, so that's why these clay pebbles are pretty critical. It increases the amount of surface area that the bacteria are allow, able to establish themselves upon and flourish, so yeah, they can work at a better rate. It's looking like I have some arugula to harvest. I don't want it to grow too tall and bolt on me. It does seem to be a pretty resilient crop. A lot of the uh, soft leaf vegetables that I put in here get eaten by the thrips. That seems to be my biggest problem with pests. And you can see the damage here on this basil. They're actually like little uh, columnar yellow insects that suck the juices out um, on the underside of the leaves or wherever they can kind of find a place. But some plants are more um, resistant to them than others. Uh, tomatoes don't seem to be affected. Uh, the arugula, like I was saying, is doing pretty well. The rosemary at first seemed to be bugged a bit, but seems to be recovering quite well. Whereas the thyme, I think it might be safe to say that one as well, suffering a bit of thrip damage. Another issue in the grow beds here, along with the bacteria, is the breaking down of old roots and root masses. As I pull things out of the beds, they leave behind their roots and what happens is the fungal gnats, their larvae uh, multiply quite quickly and kind of take over eating up all those roots but another thing you can do is introduce composting worms, red wriggler worms that will go around and eat up the dead roots and decaying matter as well and leave behind worm castings which is incredibly beneficial for the plants and then you have a fresh supply of worms available for your fishes delight or fishing delights so in the past I've had biological controls put in to try and take care of some of these insects um, ladybugs have been quite beneficial except for they do seem to want to fly away so it's hard to keep them contained another thing I've brought in are mites specific mites to eat other mites uh, spider mites now I do believe there's another species that's available too if you want to take care of thrips. So at some point in the future I'd love to try to introduce those as well. Oh, looks like we're going through a blood and drain cycle here. Let's see if I can get up close to the spouts. Like I was saying last episode, that happens a couple times every hour, maybe three times. And that fills these grow beds with water, supplying nutrients and water to the plants. And then once it's finished, they will drain back down, restoring the oxygen to the roots, which the plants need. It works really well. And along with the roots building up over time in the grow beds, the solids from the fish waste tend to as well. Uh, I've had these beds going for over two years and it hasn't seemed to be an issue yet. It's been the odd time I had to blow out one of these lines, clean it out. Generally though it was because of roots growing through them, not the fish waste. 
So it seems like things uh, are chugging along quite nicely as far as the nutrient and uh, fish waste breakdown. They don't seem to be collecting too much. Even up here in this upper tank, um, the solids accumulations are minimal. I have had issues in the past with fish uh, waste clogging up the intakes on the pumps, but I'll get into that on another episode. There's a fair bit to cover on that one. Alright, and we're nearly finished. There we go. And that's the sound of the siphon finishing as the upper barrel has been emptied. All right. So that basically covers what happens uh, in the grow beds on a generalized scale. Uh, second part of the show, I'm going to cover a little bit of the technology that I've been working on. Um, just finished connecting the logic level converter, which allows for communication between the existing microcontroller, the Arduino, and this electric imp. And what the electric imp does is allows you to connect to the internet. So by connecting the imp to the Arduino through the logic level converter, I'm allowing control and sensing of the setup to be available over the internet. So uh, I just have a short clip of me wiring that up and the finished result afterwards. The next step in that will just be to get it programmed to do what I want. But that's the next episode. So stay tuned.